Hi, welcome back to another Terranscapes uh, question and answer episode. Uh, the last one was received fairly well, seemed like, and I got more questions in this week, so we'll do another episode and we'll keep going like this until questions stop or I run out of time. But uh, right now I've got time this week as I'm not really ready to shoot a couple of the videos that I have planned uh, coming up, uh, but one will be a new product review, a new mold making compound, so keep your eye out for that and also uh, some more discussion about the Cliff Project as well as the LEDs. But I just want to put a thank you out before we get to the questions to all the people who made suggestions, the people who have contacted me about helping me. Uh, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction using an Arduino programmable uh, chip and that is going to afford me some of the control that I'm looking for and I think does some of the background work for me. I have to learn a little coding. Uh, but uh, taking a look at some of the sample code, it doesn't look too arduous as it's really been kind of pared down for uh, the non-coder, basically. Uh, so it's sort of like C-Lite or something close to that. So keep your eye posted for updates on that, and that will definitely be updated sometime next week. But before we get any further on tangents, let's uh, get to the questions this week. So the first question is from Z Spencer 1110 uh, what would you suggest for a person starting out in the world of terrain uh, making to, well, start out with? Like, which products certain pieces of terrain would put, you know, would you recommend, basically, for a war gamer on a budget? And uh, and would, I think, and he says, in a comfortable place, and I think by that meaning, you know, what's, what's going to give you a good uh, playable, you know, terrain assortment. So I think the very first thing that you need to make are hills. Uh, they're super <laughs> functional on the tabletop and they're easy to make and they're pretty cheap. Uh, you can get a sheet of insulation foam board, that's what they call pink foam. It also comes in blue and uh, you can buy those at your local hardware store or um, uh, what's a, what do you call those at Home Depot's? Home Improvement Centers. And uh, with a, even with a, a serrated knife you could cut that into some reasonable hills, sand that off, and uh, paint and flock that and you've got some basic terrain on your tabletop already. I also recommend a few impassable areas as those are easy to make and add a much more variety to the, the play of the game and you can do that by simply going out and getting a couple big rocks and gluing them on a base. They're not going to look perfect because one of the things that uh, makes a rock look unnatural is seeing undercuts underneath it because rocks usually are, you know, embedded in the soil they're they're you know being exposed so if you want to get fancier with that get a package of or a, a bucket of lightweight spackle and then just build up the soil around it to hide some of those undercuts that's going to be dirt cheap to make and very easy and uh, then you can just paint it up however you prefer and uh, maybe a sheet when you go to the Home Depot uh, or Lowe's or whatever to get your foam you might want to get a sheet of eighth inch ha what am I thinking eighth inch hardwood I'm going to get that right. H in thick hard board. Uh, you'll need a tool to cut that with and if you're on a super low budget you could probably cut it with a keyhole saw or something like that. It's going to be ugly though uh, but you could buy a jigsaw and cut it with that and if you don't have a jigsaw you probably should just have one because you can use it for a variety of things. So uh, with those two things you've already could have uh, five you know, terrain elements on your table that are going to affect play, line of sight, movement, and are probably going to cost you, well, they're going to, it's going to cost you $40 in materials, but you're going to use $3 of it for the, um, the actual pieces. Actually, now that I think about it, you can get uh, sheets of hardboard in two by two sections. They have like pre-cut area, so you can do that. And um, then you could even buy the cheapest foam they have, which is three quarter inch, buy a sheet of that. I think that's about seven or eight bucks. And then you could just glue several sections of that together to build it to whatever height you want. Um, you know, half inch, uh, well, not half inch, obviously it's three quarters. Uh, I mean, one and a half inch, one inch, two inches, whatever, you know, just keep stacking them up, glue them up, sand that down. There you go. Um, after that, it starts getting a little more time consuming and a little more expensive. Um, Philip writes, thanks for the excellent videos and inspiration. You're welcome, Philip. I appreciate that kind of feedback. I have been watching for about the last year, but I do remember some of your first videos from many moons ago. I've wondered why you use foam as the base for your boards. I would think that it's fairly weak, and if I was to use it, I would have to add a thin veneer on the bottom of the wood, uh, on the bottom of wood. Uh, is it cost or shipping issue, or is it, you know, as it would add more weight? 
A lot of people ask me that, so it's actually a very good question. The reason I use foam is that it allows me to carve into the board. And uh, frequently, I want to have subsurface, uh, not subterranean, subsurface features, you know, cutting river channels, and now I'm starting to get into depressions or when I've cut chasms in the past. And so if I made the uh, modular tiles out of wood, which I've seen some people doing recently, and I'm kind of surprised because that's a little more time consuming and certainly a little more expensive. Uh, but, um, you know, those are going to be more durable. I mean, sure. But the thing that you really need to protect with a foam playing surface is not the bottom or even the sides. It's the top. That's where it's going to receive the most wear. And that's why I coat them with foam coat, which if you haven't seen my previous videos before, that's a gypsum plaster uh, cement compound made by the Hotwire Foam Factory. Highly recommend you check them out. Uh, but um, it uh, protects the surface from dings and dents very, very well. The only real risk with using foam uh, beyond that for modular tiles is the corners. The sides, the, the edges, the top corner, as well as where it meets at a 90 degree angle, that's the most fragile spot on there, and it's not very easy to reinforce. Um, if somebody wanted me to take the extra time to veneer the sides of all the boards, which I'd have to do before I code them, otherwise you'll see the stripe. Um, that could be done, but that's going to add a lot of time to them, and you know I'm already in for a lot of time on each board as it is. So that would require really a high-end investment, uh, but it could be done, you know, on request. I mean, it, they could even be trimmed in wood, you know, um, quarter-inch uh, hardboard. I've seen uh, there's there's quite a few varieties of ways to do it. Quarter inch hardboard, eighth inch hardboard. Hmm. I'm gonna give that a little bit of thought. That might be something that's doable at a reasonable cost, but it is gonna add quite a bit of weight to them. Uh, thank you, Philip. I might, I might look into. That. I don't know why that hasn't occurred to me before. I mean, I thought about it, but um, sometimes I look back on ideas after the fact and I think about them in a new way. Um, so I'll consider that. But that's the main reason why I use foam. Uh, Skill Monkey writes again. Uh, thank you, Skill Monkey. Uh, where is your favorite brand? <laughs> I cannot talk today. What is your favorite brand of flock? Uh, what kind do you think is relatively cheap to use? And uh, when I'm building my playing boards, he's uh, building a large forest board with a lot of trees and wouldn't want to spend too much on it. What are your recommendations on budget trees that reach the Terranscapes standards? So that's really two questions there. So um, first on flock, I think if you want to go on a budget and you want a lot of flock, uh, Scenic Express sells their flock in five gallon buckets. Um, that's how I purchased it the last time. Now that's a lot of flock. <laughs> so maybe you know you go in with a club or something like that. Um, they do sell one gallon jugs, which are some of the jugs you see behind me here. And um, the one gallon jug goes pretty far. It's going to depend on how thick you're applying your flock. Uh, but they probably have the best cost uh, for value, uh, you know, for volume, I should say. And that's um, the company I'd recommend, Scenic Express. If you Google them, you'll go right to their website. They have a ton of fantastic products. Uh, it has a coarser texture, though, so be mindful of that. Um, I, Woodland Scenics, for instance, has a very fine grind to their uh, general turf blends. And that's actually one of the reasons why I blend the two together, as I like their contrasting particle sizes and their colors. Um, so different flocks have different colors cut into them. Forest uh, trees. Well, I don't know. There are no cheap trees <laughs> that look good. There aren't any. Um, you get what you pay for with trees. And if you want to buy, you know, really inexpensive trees, they're going to look inexpensive. Uh, but they function fine. So really, I mean, you know, and sometimes if you're very creative, you can take a cheap tree and you can dress it up by reflocking it or, uh, you know, adding on foliage and that kind of idea. But if you're looking for what I recommend, if you want a good looking tree that's easy and is reasonably priced, I recommend you look at Scenescapes. They do a whole line of conifer trees and Scenescapes trees are uh, very well built. They're very durable uh, and they're reasonably priced. I try to aim for a tree like that to be maybe $2 a tree on average. I want to get different sizes, so some of them will be more expensive, some of them will be smaller and cheaper, uh, but in the variety there. So, you know, $150 to $2 a tree, mm, I think those might be a little on the higher end of that. So uh, that's something to think about. Um, depends on how many trees you want. I mean, if you're going to put 150 trees on your table, 
there's no way to do that under you know three hundred dollars with shipping unless you know maybe two hundred and fifty something like that um, unless you really want to get some inexpensive trees so that's my thought. You can take a look at HobbyLink, HobbyLink.com. Uh, they have a wide selection of trees from a variety of manufacturers, so you can do some price comparison there. Anthony writes, um, Hi, your work is awesome. Thank you very much, Anthony. I don't know how to respond to these kinds of things. Um, so, thank you. I don't always agree with the audience, but I do appreciate that feedback. And so is your channel. I appreciate that. Um, do I use or have thought of using 3D software or printing your projects? On a side note, I'm currently studying digital animation and I'm on my third semester and I would like some day work in the tabletop industry, but I'm not sure if they have need of digital sculptors because from what I have seen of a lot of the work, it's still traditional sculpt. Is that the case or is the industry heading digital? Well, that's a very timely question um, because I'm interested in pursuing uh, contracting with 3D, a 3D printer. I have uh, a guy I met at the Unplugged GT, and uh, he's doing it on the hobby sort of side of it. So I've been talking to him about doing that dressing on the, the large arched uh, uh, entrance for that, that project that I'll be revisiting next week. Uh, so, you know, do, do I think there's a place for 3D printing in the industry? I definitely do. In fact, I have been so close to wanting to invest in a 3D printer for a very long time, and the thing that really holds me back is the software. It's not the purchase price or operating the machine or even the space to house it. I mean, you can get a, a solid 3D printer for t you know two, three grand right now, but I, I, the software, I can't do CAD. I don't understand. I went into uh, Google SketchUp and spent four hours trying to get a circle uh, to, to rotate a half sphere onto a, an inverted triangle. Uh, yeah, I got a long ways to go before I build a castle like that. So, um, you know, I think what what I would personally like to see, which is not representative of the industry, so, you know, this is me as a solo person, is I would love to see somebody who's interested in doing designs and would be willing to, um, you know, contract for the master, and then that would be something that I could take and then reproduce. So uh, that's the kind of direction I might see an easy entry for somebody getting into 3D sculpting. Uh, but if you uh, look at any of Games Workshop's uh, products, you'll see it's all 3D sculpted now. So uh, it, the industry is heading that direction, and it's just a matter of people mastering that software. Let's see. Uh, next question is from John. John writes... Um, Oh, he's from City on a Hill Terrain. First, um, he's a fan. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that feedback. I'm going to skip just a little bit ahead here. Uh, you've also been very generous with your time and talent and promptly responded to my myriad of questions. You're welcome. Uh, he says, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, question, uh, can you go into detail about your flocking methods, specifically how you apply glue and uh, etc.? Uh, the It's actually not that complicated. I put down PVA with a brush. I sprinkle flock on it, and then I spray seal it with a dilute uh, solution of PVA glue and water. Uh, so it's like, say, you need like 15 parts water to one part glue. Actually, I'm glad you asked that because a lot of people ask me this. I've, I've typed this many, many times. Uh, 15 parts water to one part glue will make it sprayable out of, a, you know, like a hand pump sprayer. Like for pesticides, you can get at Home Depot. But... Um, if you uh, want to just apply it with a dropper or eyedropper or a, a syringe or something like that in really small areas, you can go as much as 10 parts water to one part glue. Um, and once that dries, it will lock it down pretty effectively. It's a strong bond. Um, I also recommend adding a drop of dish detergent to it, or I use Jet Dry, which is uh, for a surfactant for um, your washing machine. And the surfactant will break up the surface tension, so it will actually wick into the foam much more easily. It will get there eventually, but it takes it a long time, and uh, depending on the kind of flock you're using and how dry it is and, and you know that sort of idea, how dense, how thick the flock is, um, it may not penetrate well. So um, a surfactant, dish soap, Jet Dry and you're good to go. Um, the trick, really, to making your flocking look good is to avoid the cow patch. Work on feathering your flock. Feather out the glue. Feather that out. <laughs> you know, cow patches. That's how I started, so please don't get me wrong, we've all been there. 
Um, so it, there's no problem if that's how you're doing it, but you will find it will look more natural if you um, can somehow increase the gradation away from the center where it's full into a thinner area to empty to end into the empty areas. Um, if, you, if you look at grasses growing out in the wild, you know, where there's a patch, it very rarely makes a, a sharp line. Sometimes in lawns it does that, but you know, when you look out in real nature, um, right, as you get further away from where it likes to grow, it gets more sparse. So um, think about that and that will help you uh, quite a bit. Uh, let's see. Um, Amber writes, I was just curious about how you went from a hobbyist to making terrain full time. Was it gradual or did you just decide to quit your job and go for it? Um, all right, well, she's got a couple questions, so we'll take them one at a time. Uh, I ended up in this job a little bit by happenstance. I used to be a middle school science teacher, and when I was teaching science, I ran a, an after-school club for Warhammer. Uh, and I won't get into the full details about how that started, but basically, a, you know, kids showed me, um, I think it was the Empire book, they were showing me flagellants, and, uh, or flagellants, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And... Uh, they uh, were, you know, talking about how they were like crazed with their Bibles and, you know, and all that. And I was looking at the miniatures. And I used to play games, D&D, &D, and collect miniatures when I was a kid. And I've always been into um, strategy games my whole life. So uh, I thought about starting a club. So I ran that club for a few years while I was teaching. It was very, very popular. Had 30 uh, students usually on a Friday ballpark coming in to game. And luckily, science tables are almost four by six for two students. They're more like four four by five, but it's perfect, so kids could just play right on those tables, and that worked out really well. Um, when I left teaching, I had uh, some terrain left over from the club, and I decided to um, sell it on eBay, and I saw that there was a market for terrain, that people were manufacturing it, making it, creating it, whatever we do, uh, you know, for for sale primarily, so I had no job really lined up at that time. I left teaching kind of in a hurry. It was kind of killing me slowly. Um, you have to have the right personality for teaching and I don't have it. And so I decided to give it a go. My wife was super supportive. She said, give it a try. I said, well, I'll do it for eight months. We'll see where that's at. And if it's not working out, I'll go somewhere else. And that was uh, six years ago. Also, does your wife ever help you with your projects? Does she enjoy tabletop gaming? Um, I would be jealous of my partner if part of his job was to drink beer and paint with the cat. <laughs> well, the drinking beer and painting with the cat part is not part of my job. I don't paint miniatures for work, and I don't uh, drink while I work. That's a bad habit. And I uh, don't really let George get too involved with work because he sheds everywhere. And uh, while there's always a cat hair in every Terranscape shipment, I try to keep the number down. Um, so uh, it is uh, nice to work from home, however, but it comes with its own set of challenges. Much like teaching is not for everybody, being an independent, you know, sort of businessman, sole proprietor, that is not for everybody. And I barely pull it off, actually. I'm moderately competent at best at it. Um, my wife does not help me with projects except to come by and tell me something looks wrong, which is awesome. I need that. Uh, and um, she does not enjoy tabletop gaming and, in fact, rarely knows what is going on down here. Um, she doesn't watch my videos and she's not interested in it, and I'm totally fine with that. So, uh, it is a lucky combo to have a husband-wife or partner combo uh, that is into wargaming. Uh, very rare. It's kind of like having your own gaming room, something I dream of someday. Can you tell me how to make her starts pieces? Oh, this is by uh, Thamus, uh, or Thamus, which is almost famous. Uh, can you tell me how to make her starts pieces and what tools and machines you use? Well, I'm not sure about that question, except to say that I don't make her starts pieces in, if you mean the individual blocks, I, I cast them from molds that Hearst Starts sells. So the masters for those molds are manufactured by Bruce Hearst. You should also visit HearstStarts.com. Long list of places you should visit today. If you haven't been to any of these places I'm mentioning today, you should stop this video and go start looking at them. Seriously. But, um, so I cast those. 
Right now, I'm using um, Hydrostone, I believe, for my casting. Very hard uh, gypsum plaster. I used to be, I used to use Tough Stone, which was a fiber reinforced plaster. I'm having trouble getting it, so I've shifted to Hydrostone, a little easier to get, and um, it's been, um, I think, in some ways, a better product. Each each plaster has its own pros and cons. Once I cast those up, um, then I hand assemble everything. So there's no tools or machinery involved, except when you're casting, it is helpful to have a vibrating table. Go to herstarts.com and look at how he says for his advanced casting techniques. Look at that. Um, and uh, if you want to get more advanced, then you can get into vacuum degassing your plaster molds, and that requires uh, much more of an investment. So, uh, but that's that's a way to step it up. So I use a vacuum chamber. I stick uh, the plaster in there, degas the plaster first, pour it into the mold, degas the mold, pull it out. Super crisp detail every time. Uh, from David. I'm a long-time video YouTube watcher, and I love your work and appreciate your opinion and insight. Thank you very much. You guys are really nice to me. I appreciate that. Um, I've been using ballast from Woodland Scenics for years for basing miniatures and small terrain features. On larger features, I've used kitty litter uh, from the 99 cent store. Uh, long story short, I am now completely rebuilding my gaming table and terrain features, and I would like to have the same quality look that I get from the ballast without spending a fortune. I assume that what you are using is sand to uh, grit your tables. Um, so what would you suggest for adding texture to the foam boards and, uh, and tree features? I'm sorry, the question I think is in two parts. And tree features that will be cheap considering the size of the project. So I mentioned trees before, so that's sort of been covered. Um, if you don't like conifers, then it gets a little bit trickier. Um, and for texture. Well, I've never used kitty litter. I've seen a lot of people use kitty litter. Um, it's clay based, but I don't know how that holds up to, say, sealing flock or abrasion. You know, those particles might crumble easily. I don't know. If you want to try clay kitty litter, I would recommend maybe for basing miniatures it's okay because that doesn't get a lot of abuse, but I don't think that's going to really work for a table. And uh, Woodland Scenics ballast is going to cost a fortune. Like, that's going to cost a lot. So I don't recommend that either, except to use it maybe in discrete areas where you want to add some varying particle sizes. I go back to the standby, a big bag of sand. <laughs> you know, you can't go wrong with that. It's cheap and it works every time. Um, you know what? You, uh, here's a tip for sand, though. If you want various particle sizes, Buy a bag of traction sand. Well, this is only going to work if you're in the north. Um, but anyway, it's got larger chunks of grit in it. And uh, what I do is I use a sieve. Um, I have an old colander that, you know, I retired from the kitchen. And then you can sift out various grain sizes out of your sand and then, you know, allocate them into piles. And then as you coat your thing, your board, your, your mountain, your hills, whatever, you know, you can do it with the fine sand and then sprinkle a little grit in areas where you want to enhance the texture. Um, you can use um, play sand as well. Um, play, you know, like sandbox sand. It's very fine, so it looks nice scale-wise, but it's very uniform. So you might want to find something to add to it. Uh, but I can't think of anything better than sand for, you know, on its value and its look. Uh, but um, think about a colander or a fine sieve. If you're concerned that the particle sizes are too big, sift it out and get the good stuff out of it. That's my recommendation. Um, and that's it for this week. So. Um, thank you to everyone who submitted this week. Hopefully you all found something useful in this uh, segment. Um, definitely visit all those websites. I'm not going to put links in the description, uh, but um, you know any of these sites that I've mentioned are easy hits on Google. So um, check them out. Uh, they're all going to offer you a variety of products that you may not have seen before at um, some affordable prices and are going to totally enhance your terrain making if this is a hobby for you as well. So. Um, like I said, keep an eye on the channel. I will be back uh, shortly. I would like to shoot a video maybe midweek next week, so probably around next Friday or something like that. Expect another one to show up. No promises in case there's a weird thing that delays me, which happens all the time. But uh, there will be one soon. So um, if you want to leave questions, 
for the Q&A section, um, please um, email them to Mike at G... Um, Mike. I... How many of these episodes do I have to do before I get that right? Email them to Terranscapes at gmail.com. Terranscapes. Do not put them in the comment section. I will not answer them there uh, because I like to sort them and this I, I can have them all in a Word doc and just scroll through it on the laptop, which is very helpful for me. So um, thank you once again for joining me. I do appreciate it. And thank you again for all the kind words. Everybody's included in these messages. Um, it's, uh, it's really nice to hear. And uh, thank you. So I'll talk to you later.